when we first started the band, um, particularly uh, the lineups that made the Duran Duran Rio album and the third album, I think we really made ourselves a manifesto of what Duran Duran was going to be about. And that wasn't really entirely about it's going to be rock guitar, dance grooves, electronics and beautiful melodies. There was a dark side to it and there was a, a slightly more rock side sometimes and then there was the art side. This blueprint of Duran Duran sort of almost remains intact now. John Taylor and I grew up in uh, Hollywood, Birmingham, and uh, I met John when I was 10 years old, he was 12, and we bonded over music. Uh, we would uh, you know, sit down and play David Bowie records together, and it was a time of glam rock and Sparks, Cockney Rebel, Roxy Music, um, were all very sort of influential on our lives at that time. John and I were um, avid record collectors, and so we always used to um, go into Birmingham every Saturday or Friday night, we were waiting for the new albums to come out, and there were several stores we used to go to. I remember the Virgin store, actually, when it was on Corporation Street, and um, we went there, and we were spent so much time in there. I remember the staff saying to us one day, will you two just make yourself useful here? If you do this, you do this job, you sort through all the racks and you put all the records in the right order again, um, we'll give you an album each. Well, John and I couldn't believe our luck. I think we must have done sort of the 20 hours work to get our, our album, but we, we just couldn't believe it. We used to go to concerts together at the Birmingham Town Hall, the Odeon, uh, what was then Bingley Hall. Uh, and then later, as it developed into punk times in all the smaller venues of Rebecca's, Barbarella's, the Golden Eagle, the Crown, places like that, our lives just evolved around music. All we wanted was to be in a band. And I knew that when I was 10, 11 years old. Um, I, you know, at that time, your parents look at you and say, oh, that's, that's nice, darling, isn't it? That's really nice. Hoping you'll grow out of it. But, uh, but with John and I, that just wasn't the case. We were, um, we were writing out our potential tour schedules when we were sort of 15, 14, 15 years old, where we'd play, trying to figure out how many trucks we would need for all the gear, uh, what kind of lighting we were going to have, and what the tour program would be like, which was, of course, pure fantasy. But I suppose that determination and the vision that we had even at that time is what led to us forming the band. Neither of us could play anything. I think I picked up a guitar for the first time when I was 14 and started learning to play guitar and John was also learning to play guitar, um, which was the right sort of instrument to play at punk times. I remember going to a uh, punk rock festival at Birmingham Barbarella's, um, an all-day punk festival with John and um, I was looking at the guys on stage in this one band and I was looking at the chords they were playing on the guitar and it was this fantastic realization, uh, an epiphany, that um, I could play those chords. And I thought, I could have played that song all the way through. And I got home and I figured it out. And I was right. And at that point, this sort of dream of um, wanting to be in a band became more of a reality. And, and that was what was so incredible about punk rock, apart from the amazing energy and the change and the social impact that it had, it was that anyone could get up on stage and actually play a song and it meant something. And it was, it was, it was really a big swing away from the techno rock that we were all used to, the things like um, Emerson, Lake and Palmer and, uh, and Pink Floyd and uh, some, some amazing things, but very, very accomplished. This was really um, when we realized there could be a band.
When I was working at the Rum Runner Club, I actually was the one that got the best job because I had a pretty decent record collection. So I said, well, I'll DJ. Hadn't got a clue how to DJ, but I think there was a couple of record decks and I could put the headphones on and put one on after the other one. So I, I was DJing. Um, some of the other guys didn't get quite as good a job. So I think Andy was cooking in the kitchen. Uh, John, uh, Roger was behind the bar. Uh, I don't know what John was doing actually. Maybe he was he was collecting the glasses up or something. But we were all working in this uh, this club to earn enough money so that we could survive the week through rehearsals. I swapped to synthesizer when uh, the first synthesizer came out that was affordable. It was called the Wasp. It was a little yellow and black thing, like a toy, really, with a metal keyboard that was touch sensitive, and it was plastic molded with bright yellow and black knobs on it. Uh, and that was really the first instrument that, uh, that I fell in love with. I just thought, I can master this. I know what to do with it. Unfortunately for me, you could only play one note at a time, so it was a good place to start. Um, and that was, that was what I used in our very early shows. John was still playing guitar. Uh, when we formed the band, I was 16, uh, uh, John was playing guitar. Simon Colley was playing uh, clarinet and bass. Stephen Duffy was our singer. He also played bass. John was playing guitar. I had a rhythm unit, a wasp synthesizer, and a tape recorder, a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder which I used to record things on um, during the daytime and then a mixing desk, I'd fade them up in and out randomly um, through our songs. It, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a real art school band. John was at art school in Birmingham with uh, Stephen Duffy, uh, which was very handy because it meant that they could make all our posters together and uh, they, they were all very z rocked and beautifully designed and the logos were on them. And we played our first show um, at Birmingham Polytechnic um, and that was, I think we had about half an hour of music and there was about 20 people in the audience uh, and, but it was, it was exciting to actually get on stage and know that we'd rehearsed these things together and made songs. John and I, uh, with, with Stephen Duffy and Simon Colley, got a call from Fashion, um, John Mulligan's band. And they said, look, we're playing uh, one show at Barbarella's. Will you come and support us? Uh, we, we were sort of honored and terrified at the same time. We'd never played a venue that big. We'd been playing to 30 and 40 people, and suddenly it was a few hundred people. And I didn't realize until many, many, many years later that one of the people in the audience that night was Roger Taylor. I was particularly a big fan of a band called Fashion. And I went to see Fashion at Barbara Ellis one night. I was in the audience and this uh, rather strange band called Duran Duran trooped on as a support band. And uh, Nick kind of had one keyboard and it looked like he got it on a Meccano set. John was playing the guitar. And I, th I think they had a sax an oboe player or something. A little strange like that. The singer was quoting Oscar Wilde, I think. As Stephen Duffy walked on stage and he said, um, this is in front of a sort of punk crowd, it would have been 1979 by then, I suppose, but people are still pogoing and spitting and throwing things. And, and he walked on and he, in his uh, most effect voice, he said, hello everybody, good evening, we're Duran Duran. Uh, this is a song that was inspired by the work of F. Scott Fitzgerald. And I thought, oh no, we are going to die. And then I had to push Foxtrot on my rhythm box very, very slowly. And it came on with this little beat. And we didn't really have much guitar because John mostly made a noise with, 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 with the guitar at that point. But somehow it worked. It went down quite well and we were we were on pretty good form. 
Uh, but I think they're really good. I thought these guys, you know, I could just hear this. They had something in their music that had this real uh, pop sensibility, I guess, in the music. And I just thought that this band could be the next big thing out of Birmingham. I don't know why, I just had that feeling. I remember one of our most triumphant gigs early on in Birmingham was actually at the Cedar Club. Uh, it was near Christmas time and we'd really built up a following and so everybody came and um, uh, we, we did Planet Earth there and we, we filmed at the show with that footage actually does exist. Um, we, we, we filmed the song and you can see at the end some of the, the, the new romantic mobsters we were hanging out with at the time. They actually pile onto the stage but the, uh, the energy in it and the enthusiasm and the jubilation uh, it still makes me smile. And I, anyway, I went home and never thought anything else of it. I had a mate called Andy Wicket, who I kind of been in a kind of jammed around with a bit. He was working nights at Cadbury's, by the way, at that point. And he said, "Ah, oh, I'm, I'm singing with this band. I've just joined this band." But the, the guitar player John, he, he wants to start playing the bass, and they're looking for a drummer. I said, "Okay, yeah, yeah. I saw him the other week. Yeah, fantastic. I'll, I'll come down for the audition." We've got a band together called uh, TVI. We moved into a house in Cheapside, Digbus. So I turned up at this little, it was literally a squat in the middle of Birmingham, in Cheapside in Birmingham. And like, Duran Duran used to rehearse in my bedroom and that. But towards the end, I was like, that someone kicked the front door off and we'd come downstairs and be tramp sleeping in there. And my dad, I was still living with my, my parents. My dad brought me down with my drums in the back of his car. He said, wow, what the hell is this? You don't even, you know, it's a squat, you shouldn't even be going in there. I said, no, no, I'm going to go in there really good. Nick Bates, or the boy, he's called Nick Rose now, he used to come round and tape us and that, and he used to come to our gigs and that. Then um, I left the band and um, their singer, Stephen Duffy, left Duran Duran and uh, joined up with TVI and they became the Hawks. And, uh, and then I, I joined Duran Duran. Uh, so I set up with the band in there. John came over, he, used to, he just started playing the bass. And he said, can you do funky hi-hats? I said, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll give it to us. Tried trying to play these funky hi-hats. He started playing this funky disco-y bass. And that was it. So that's what got me in the band. Well, this is um, John Taylor, who was Nigel then. And, uh, Nick Bates, who's now Nick Rhodes, and uh, Roger, uh, the drummer, was in it. There's a guy on guitar from London, uh, Alo. And, uh, so when uh, John and I um, had first formed the band, uh, we uh, we wanted to go into the recording studio and make demos. Uh, we didn't know where to start. We'd never been in the studio before. We actually never made it uh, into a studio together with uh, the lineup with Stephen Duffy and Simon Colley. But um, the next incarnation um, with Andy Wickett uh, as our singer, we, we went into Bob Lamb's studio. So a bed was up there and the studio was underneath his bed sort of thing. And another room with like old egg boxes with the drummer was stuffed in a corner. And uh, this little mixing desk that Bob had made himself out of a kit. It was pretty much like a 24 hour nightclub, right? the entire house if you like. It, it never stopped. Seven days a week. Uh, it was in King's Heath, um, which was not far from where we lived. We, we could all get there with our gear on the bus or get, get our parents to drop us off 
and Bob was amazing. The parents would bring them round, you know, carry their bits and pieces in and have a look around the studio and stuff. And they were really young, but they, 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 had, they had a lot going for them because they were very flamboyant and colourful people. And great players, great songs, great, great music. So I, I always kind of knew that they were gonna, they were gonna make it. I cherish those days we spent in his studio. He, um, he recorded all our early demos, and then after Andy Wickett, we had another singer called Jeff Thomas. And then when we finally reached the original um, Duran Duran lineup that made the first records with uh, the three Taylors, the three unrelated Taylors, um, which I still can't explain, um, Simon Laban and myself, uh, we, we went into Bob's studio and that's when we first made uh, music together and demos for songs that we felt we were moving somewhere forward. We were, we were potentially in with a chance of attracting some record labels to come to see us perform in Birmingham. And this was uh, a remarkable breakthrough. When I was with them, they, um, Nick's dad took them down to uh, EMI and stuff and they said they really liked girls on film. And so I knew they'd got, you know, they were gonna, they were onto something. I remember demoing at Bob's Planet Earth, um, Girls on Film, Save a Prayer. I mean, the, the first two albums were almost entirely demoed uh, in, in Bob's studio, and the demos sound very, very close to the originals. In fact, I heard. Um, Save a Prayer uh, some months ago. And it's almost identical, apart from the third verse, as, as an entirely different lyric, uh, which I'd forgotten about. But it was getting the sound. I mean, he was recording you before his first album there. So. I remember we were uh, demoing the, uh, the first album with Bob, and he said, oh, I've, I've just been in with this band you before, so you have listened to this. I thought, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, great, great. We were kind of like in a parallel universe to the UB40. Um, we're from the, obviously from the same city. We started around the same time. We, they actually used to rehearse next door to us at the Rum Runner, you know, in one of the old rooms there. And we used to kind of share amps and speakers and all sorts. And they were in one room singing about being on the dole and how miserable it was in Birmingham and all that. And we were in the other room singing about girls on film and. Rio and you know a completely different uh, subject matter for the songs which obviously the, the two bands went in two very different directions because we had this kind of aspirational view of the world and theirs was very earthy and very uh, about Birmingham and where they were from and uh, it's funny that we, we were so close in some ways but so different. I remember one day we were rehearsing uh, in Birmingham by the Rum Runner Club, and in one room um, there was UB40 on, on that side, then there was us, and on the other side there was Dex's Midnight Runners. We auditioned and rehearsed in the disused casino that used to be on the alley that went down to the uh, Rum Runner. And uh, while Duran Duran was starting, and they were rehearsing down in the club with bottles of chilled Chablis, as I remember. <laughs> and we were in the rat infested uh, um, old casino with a space eater roaring away. Well, you couldn't have had three more diverse bands together, but it was pretty extraordinary that this stuff was all coming out of Birmingham. A lot of bands at the time that were making it big out of Birmingham, Dex's Medart Runners had just made it big. UB40 were kind of bubbling under uh, the beat, were on top of the pops you know, that week. It was a bit tribal uh, in that you couldn't like Duran Duran and the beat. <laughs> it had to be one or the other, you know, so we kind of see Duran and Duran and Duran. Alright, alright. Yeah, but you couldn't like hang out, you know, that wouldn't be cool. Well, I was playing in a few different bands actually around that time, and uh, I was very much into the, uh, the music scene that was happening in Birmingham. 
Um, there, was, there was a real vibe in the town at the time. There were so many music venues. I particularly loved um, Rebecca's and Barbarella's. That was sort of across the road from, you had the, the runway across the road. Right? And Barbarella's I was going to for years, seeing all these amazing artists. I saw Blondie and Talking Heads and Television and uh, Generation X and Johnny Thunder's Heartbreakers and all these, all these amazing acts. We did play at Little Lakes Holiday Park as well in Beaudla. So we went there with Duran Duran and we just no one there. We got quite a good payment for the time, you know, at the time. At the time of the Rum Runner Club, which was uh, at the center of all Duran Duran activity in the, in the early 80s. I knew everybody in there, and they all knew us. We used to hang out with Patty Bell and Jane Kahn and, uh, and, and all the other mob and Mike Horseman, and all the people from Birmingham, and we, we'd have an amazing time there. And that club really was wild, but in, in a beautiful way. It was just people at the end of the week going out dressing up and doing what they wanted to do. In contrast, the Blitz Club was what was going on in London. And we thought, oh, well, I suppose there's all, there'll be sort of trumping airs somehow. And we all went to the Blitz Club one night. And I have to say, it was really pretty dull uh, because everything was much more uptight and it didn't feel real and it didn't have that spirit and what we have in Birmingham is that incredible spirit. It was, uh, it was a pretty exciting time because they had different nights at the Rum Runner. Uh, one, one was a sort of jazz funk night. There was a DJ there called Dave Till. And we always used to stand there listening to this funk stuff thinking, hmm, actually that's a pretty good groove, isn't it? We'd go and start playing because we were rehearsing at the Rum Runner. We'd go up to the room on, on his night and start playing. They'd say, can someone turn them down because it started interfering with what was going on there. But we learned a lot being in the club because Paul and Michael Barrow, who, um, who were running the club at the time, uh, just got back from New York City and I remember Paul brought in his record box with all these fantastic 70s disco things that you go, have you heard this chaps? And he put something on and we were like, wow, actually that does have something to it. And so I remember that time very fondly and just trying to make our hybrid of rock music and dance music and the Rum Runner really, um, it was so inspirational. Uh, every night there was something different going on there with a completely different crowd of people. You'd see people sort of coming in dressed in sort of jeans and trainers the one night and uh, then two nights later there was feathers and, and, uh, and shoulders out to here. So we always had this feeling that we knew that we could make it big because of this history of bands that had come from, from Birmingham. There's a real originality in Birmingham. Um, I, I mentioned Dex's Midnight Runners, UB40 and us, all rehearsing in one, uh, in one space at the same time. You don't find that in many places. We're, we're, a, we're a very culturally diverse city. It's very much part of our makeup, you know, the, the great music culture in Birmingham. And I think we were probably in the first wave of bands to break away from that heritage of, you know, heavy, heavy rock. And I think we, we, we appreciated where we'd come from. We really knew that we'd come from a city that was, you know, heavy in culture and heavy in music culture. And so many great bands had come from there. Um, in fact, I used to live around the corner from Jeff Lynne. I, I used to see him drive past in his brand new Range Rover when the, you know, the ELO, the Move were, were making it. At the time, I think we probably got a lot of criticism from the more serious rock critics because they felt that um, we had too much to do with fashion or art and photography and that perhaps, God forbid, it might be a little pretentious. But of course, I love pretentious. As things unfolded, and new artists started coming out over the last couple of decades, it became much more evident that we weren't the only band that were interested in graphic design and photography, and then video happened, and everybody suddenly had to pay a little more attention to what they were doing.
And so um, now making the new Duran Duran album, uh, here we are in 2010, I find myself looking at our first two albums particularly and saying, well, this sounds like the follow-up to Rio. Um, it's, it's got the same DNA, the same kind of energy to it. And that was Mark Ronson's dream about the album. He said, I'd love to make the follow-up to Rio. And somehow he's, uh, he's absolutely uh, found a way to do it.